Hello, BookTube. I'm having a very vampiric October already. <laughs> I'm doing a, a read aloud of Bram Stoker's Dracula with Mark at Book Time with Elvis and Micah Cummins. Uh, and I'm also doing a read along of Vampire of the Stat by Anne Rice with Matthew at Maybury Book Club. And that has made me think more and more about vampire books. I am kind of thinking that I might read a million of them <laughs> in October. And that got me thinking about a starter kit. I haven't done a starter kit in a while. Let's do a starter kit of uh, vampire fiction. Uh, just as some, some, of course, this barely scratches the surface, but these are things like many of my starter kits where if you haven't read any, you might want to read these, you know, rather than waste your time with a vast amount of C-rate stuff. Instead, go for the stuff that it, for one reason or another is most worth your time. There's one item on this list that's going to shock a lot of you. <laughs> but uh, but vampire fiction has been written all over the world. In all kinds of registers, you can find vampire fiction that is uh, private investigator novels, urban novels, romance novels, all kinds of things, post-apocalyptic novels. Uh, and since vampire fiction deals with impalatable food, very pale strangers, wintry weather. <laughs> it's a natural mix with Nordic noir. <laughs> so we'll, we'll start off our starter kit with that, with Let the Right One In by John Lindquist, uh, which is, a, it, it's sort of uh, Carmilla the Vampire meets Stranger Things, where uh, a, young, a young man, a young boy is uh, enraptured by a, a new female neighbor. There's a body that's found in the neighborhood completely drained of blood, and she shows up at the same time, and she's very pale and uh, seems a little a little disconnected from human life and never goes out during the day. Uh, and the, a lot of you might know this from its film adaptations, but the book is tremendously good. Uh, so we'll start we'll start with that, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, a novel that started out life as a romance novel and is then was adapted into a very popular movie. That is Anne Rice's book, Interview with a Vampire, uh, which is very rich, very atmospheric, very strong on the kind of subterranean elements that are present in almost all vampire lore. Uh, the, the, there's an element of the vampire legends that were drawn together in modern, you know, the modern instantation from, from uh, 1897 on that in addition to being a creature of horror, uh, of vampires are also very much a creature of sensuality. And this book really stresses that it really does in a wonderful way. There is, the, it stresses the sensuality of the vampire mythos and also the Gothic nature of it. And also the gradual nature of it. It's it, it or the the idea that is that is often effectively done in vampire fiction is that it is a, a miasma that engulfs you slowly rather than a sharp fan creature who breaks your neck instantly as soon as they see you or kills you and, or drains you dry as soon as they see you. Then instead, it's more of a slow, seductive process. This book captures that wonderfully. So it's an amazing reading experience for that. Uh, then to we, we can go from the slow and the gothic and the sensual to the more abrupt element. Because on one level, uh, when we talk about vampires, we are talking about supernatural beings, yes, who are seductive and incremental. But we're also talking about super beings. Vampires are almost indestructible. They are incredibly strong. They have all sorts of superpowers. Uh, they have vulnerabilities, too, in their best uh, incarnations. They have vulnerabilities. But... They are also super beings, so you can put them anywhere and liven up a drama, including uh, World War II military fiction. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do for here. This is David Bishop's. This is his uh, Fiends of the Eastern Front. I think, uh, I think I'm think i being undone by the light here. Let's put it over on the other side and see. Although it would be really kind of interesting if uh, if the lighting was a problem in a vampire, in a vampire story. Uh, this is... Uh, this volume called Fiends of the Eastern Front is what is a collection of shorter novels. What Booktube, for some odd reason, insists on referring to as a bind-up. Uh, this is a collection of, of, of shorter novels uh, set in uh, the, uh, the front lines of World War II. 
where there is a, a hapless German recruit who is slowly but surely learning the ways of a very strange uh, foreign unit <laughs> that, that uh, always seems to operate only at night and that leaves in its wake not only bodies drained of blood, but bodies convulsed in absolute terror, far greater terror than the terrors of war. Uh, these are tremendously good. <laughs> one of you, one of you actually sent me this collection. It's a, there's a big fat collection, but you can, all, you can also get, I think this has five books in it and you can also get those individual books. Um, but this is, this is, uh, wow, that is almost black. Uh, this is vampire fiction done in a very, uh, grim, dark way, almost a very, very, uh, bitter and historical and steeped in legend. Uh, and then for our next book, uh, we can deal with something that's far more contemporary that is set in the contemporary day. One of the big draws of vampire fiction is always to take this creature of vaguely medieval legend and put them in a contemporary setting. Uh, and this one, the, in this book, the, the setting is Los Angeles. <laughs> this is They Thirst by Robert McCammon. Uh, we'll get the cover to come out as well as we can here. And this is the story of Vampires Take L.A. Uh, it's a big, generous book, tremendously fun to read. Robert McCammon, a lot of his, uh, a lot of his more atmospheric, psychological, stand-by-me type horror really doesn't work for me. Boy's Life just doesn't work for me. But when he deals with uh, stereotypical universal monster creatures like werewolves or vampires he's terrific uh and they thirst is my the second favorite thing that he's he did a werewolf novel that i love but he also did this is his vampire novel and it's tremendously tremendously successful you will want it to be longer uh then when we talk about really long and really successful vampire novels i'm going to put a name on the top 10 list that you never thought i'd do and that is stephen king uh i'm next will be salem's lot which is his vampire novel the reason that it's on this list is, I mean, it is it is hammy and overwritten even now. Uh, it's easy. The prose is very easy, not in the complimentary way of easy to read, but in the derogatory way of easy to write. It's This is a... It reads like first draft fiction. Now, the only difference, the reason it's on this list is because so unlike so much of later Stephen King writing after this book, it isn't actually first draft fiction. This is when he could still be edited. And this is another incarnation of vampire fiction, much like Let the Right One In. Vampire fiction is often uh, done to best advantage when it is a small terror, when it's a small community, a local community that is dealing with this thing that suddenly plants itself and wants to suborn a neighborhood. And that's what happens here. Uh, a vampire and his human servant, his Renfield, uh, come to a small New England town. And the the atmospherics are well done. Uh, they are well done. If, if I were in a used bookstore and saw a cheap copy of, like, for instance, the latest trade paperback of Salem's Lot is quite pretty, I would probably get it. This is a Stephen King novel that I would probably actually own and have on my shelves. Uh, and this, this next one is... Uh, a riff on a towering work. There is there is one towering vampire work of fiction. And this is a riff on that. This is Kim Newman writing Anno Dracula. Uh, and it is a riff on Bram Stoker's Dracula. Saying that the events in Bram Stoker's Dracula uh, were fiction. Which, you, you know, you're thinking obviously. But in the world of this novel... They were fiction because it didn't really happen that way. Instead, Dracula's invasion of England was successful. In Bram Stoker's Dracula, it's not. Dracula is planning on branching out. He's planning on moving to London and having a whole new population of people to feast upon. Uh, and in that book, he is thwarted. In this book, he is not. In this book, that this book takes place in a world in which he was never thwarted, and in which there would be a commercial appeal in someone writing a novel in which he was. <laughs> so, so in this book, Dracula by Bram Stoker is alternate fiction, alternate history. Here, Dracula succeeds and brings the whole of his Euro trash Transylvania set of, of vampires with him. They become the new de facto ruling class of London, as he is the prince consort of Queen of Queen Victoria, and. 
Kim Newman creates, uh, uses a whole bunch of previously created fictional stuff. Every single character of Victorian history, and especially of Victorian fiction, is either in this book or mentioned in this book. Uh, but in addition to that, Kim Newman also creates his own cosmology of vampires, which is all about bloodlines. In, and that, that is canny and acutely done, because in Dracula, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, Dracula's forever going on about his bloodline. It turns out that there are different bloodlines of vampires, and a couple of them are even older than Dracula's, and therefore more powerful. In this book, the older you are, the more powerful you are. So these half-vampire, weird, sickly, undead gets that are polluting the back alleys of London, and that are made just offhandedly without thinking of it and without caring by all of these Transylvanian, Carpathian noblemen that Dracula brought with him to the to the capital. They represent the very dregs of the vampire world, whereas we have a main character, Genevieve, who is even older than Dracula and who is dead set against him ruling the world, even if she has to uh, ally herself with valiant mortals. It is unbelievably good, just unbelievably good and, and perfect fodder for Victober, just perfect. Because, like I mentioned, all of Victorian literature is in here. <laughs> Just all of it. Everybody that you could think of, from Sherlock Holmes, who's mentioned, to a Lord Greystoke, who is mentioned. A whole, of course, all of vampire lore is in here. Any previous vampire lore is in here. And a whole bunch of contemporary vampire fiction. Vampire novels written by other people. Count St. Germain shows up in here. It, it's, it's utterly delightful and completely engrossing. When Kim Newman wants to uh, torque up the action with an action, uh, the the action of the book with uh, you know a tense scene, an action moment, they are wonderful. <laughs> so and also vampires of other cultures are brought in here as well, which is interesting. So this is this is just uh, sort of the a, a sort of a grand gurgnel, sort of a, a Rube Goldberg fascination with the whole idea of vampires and dracula in popular fiction and in folklore just just amazing and with it a, a very very good ending because it started out as a short story and short stories unlike modern novels have to have endings <laughs> so uh then uh anno dracula is kind of a, a meditation on the literature on the literary effect of bram stoker's novel dracula and of taking that literary effect pulling it out of where we have it and putting it in a totally new cosmology. Uh, and the same thing kind of is true for this next book, a huge bestseller, Elizabeth Kostova's book, The Historian, uh, which I'm not, I have no light now. I don't know why. Could be the subject. Uh, this is the story of a young woman who gradually learns that she, that her family has a huge history with uh, Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> and, and for the longest time as the book is going on, it's a long book and it is wonderfully written. M very much like uh, Donna Tartt's The Secret History meets Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, as the book is going on, you really don't want it to stop. You really want it to continue. And it is incredibly atmospheric. And as it's going on, more and more hints are being dropped that this isn't just a family history exercise, that there's, the, that there's a lot more going on here than genealogy, that in fact, Dracula is real, immortal, and still exists. <laughs> and, and you just have to wait. You just have to, you, the novel takes its own time getting you there. Uh, then this next one is something I've recommended on this channel many times. This is The Light at the End uh, by John Skip and Craig Spector. This is a, a modern urban vampire novel, or one of the first urban vampire novels, uh, say, taking place, unlike They Thirst, which takes place in LA, this takes place in New York. And is about a vampire who is just haunting the subway tunnels. He's haunting the back alleys. He's killing people. And some of you will be familiar with the incredibly great first episode of the what became a TV show called Night Stalker. Uh, the very first episode of that features a vampire who is who is suddenly on the loose in L.A. And it is a perfect, perfect uh, vampire movie. That first episode, that first two-hour episode of Night Stalker is great, but it also shows you, it shows you the, the sort of appeal of putting a vampire in a modern, contemporary, especially urban setting. You want to see what will happen, and naturally law enforcement will think they're dealing with uh, an ordinary human serial killer, even an ordinary human serial killer who has a thing for acting like a vampire. 
Uh, so you just get to watch that unfold, and it will seem, when you're reading this, if you're reading it for the first time, it will seem very by the numbers. And the point that I want to make is that it made the numbers. <laughs> it's it's only by the numbers because so many people have imitated imitated this recipe. But this, this one is terrific. Uh, then we can go back into history. Uh, usually when you're dealing with a historical novel, dealing with vampires, you are dealing with two things. You're either dealing with the Victorian era, which is when Van Dracula was written, or you're dealing with the distant past when Dracula, the, when Vlad the Impaler somehow became a vampire. Uh, so situating a vampire in any other historical event, in other, any other historical era, is always interesting if it's done well. That is actually the basis for Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough's uh, long series of books on Count St. Germain, who is a vampire but who has lived for thousands of years. So it isn't just the idea you get in Bram Stoker's Dracula where Dracula is sort of a in mothballs in Transylvania for centuries until he decides to branch out. Instead, it's that you, you follow a vampire living through all different time periods and what that would be like. Uh, and that that is what happens in this book, which is set in America uh, in the years before the American Civil War. This is Fever Dream. Uh, by George R. R. Martin, whose name is not on this cover. No, his name is not on this cover. Uh, this is by George R. R. Martin, back when he also could be edited. And it makes a huge amount of difference. All of his science fiction that he wrote, all the science fiction that he wrote is great because he could do it under the guise of an editor. He could do it while being edited by a helpful person who was not cowed by the fact that he was making his publisher tens of millions of dollars. Uh, this book was also written that way, and it very much shows. <laughs> it has a lot less of the egregious overwriting, a lot less of the obvious padding that fills The Song of Ice and Fire, uh, and that, you know, characterizes Martin's later work, unfortunately. Uh, I would argue that, it's, that that is a greater tragedy in the case of an author like this than in the case of an author like Stephen King, who never had all that much talent to begin with. So you know, it's not a huge loss if you take away the editor. Here you do, you lose something. Uh, unfortunately, if that were not the case, if this author were still working uh, the way normal authors do, then A Song of Ice and Fire would have been finished 10 years ago, and we would be on to some new fantasy epic or science fiction epic or whatever other kind of epic that he wants to write. We'd have 10 more books. Uh, but this is the story of, of a vampire who uh, takes over a a Mississippi boat line that is failing uh, and has his own reasons. And you as a reader know perfectly well what those reasons are, or at least you can guess at them. Oh, it's the characters in the book who don't know. One of the, the, the ongoing fun gimmicks of vampire fiction is how, how little people in the world have to understand that vampires even exist. So, so that you will, in 1997, you will be reading a vampire novel and at page 200 of a 300 page book, one of the characters will look at the other and say, it's almost like it's a creature that drinks blood. <laughs> you're living in an alternate world if you're living in a world without Dracula by Bram Stoker. That's one, one of the most refreshing things about, for instance, uh, The Lost Boys, the movie The Lost Boys, is that uh, the, the crusty old man in town who doesn't, have a TV because he subscribes to TV Guide. Don't need a TV if you subscribe to TV Guide. <laughs> he, uh, he knows perfectly well what's going on, uh, as, is, as is evidenced in the immortal last line of that movie. It's, uh, that's the thing about Santa Clara, all the damn vampires. <laughs> uh, th that you get a little bit of that in this book where characters seem unbelievably naive. Uh, but it's George R. R. Martin's meditation on the vampire mythos, and it is tremendously effective. Just tremendously so. Uh, then uh, we're going to get to uh, basically number one. We're, we're basically going to get to number one, but it's going to have many incarnations. Number one, of course, on a vampire fiction list is Bram Stoker's Dracula. I've been amazed in the last month or two to realize how many of you have never read Dracula, not even once. I don't know how many times I've read Dracula. I've, I've completely lost count. It's It's a lot. It's... There's the little count. Hey, baby. What you doing? You want to come down on the couch? Is that what you're doing? There you go. Uh, it amazes me that uh, how many of you haven't read this book at all. But it is naturally number one on a list of, of vampire fiction. I've now completely lost control of the light. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll look at the video. If it can't be seen, then I'll remake it. Uh, but... 
when it comes to Bram Stoker's Dracula, there are a whole bunch of points that I want to make. Of course, it has been there have been 80 million editions of this book, and uh, some of them come with introductions, some of them come without, some come with lots and lots of notes, some don't. Uh, the, one of the points that I want to make about uh, the novel Dracula is that you don't need notes at all to enjoy it. Uh, how does this, does this work? Let's do that. Uh, you don't need any notes to enjoy this book at all. You don't need an introduction or an afterword or anything like that. You can plunge right in and read it. Uh, and that's the number one foremost recommendation that I want to make here is that you read Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's free on Project Gutenberg. Uh, I'm sure that your library has 10 copies of it. I'm, I, I'm sure that you can get a used copy for a dollar. Uh, and it's such a fundamental part of, of modern speculative fiction that it, it's, it behooves, in addition to how great it is, it behooves you to read it. Uh, but when we get to number one on a list of vampire fiction, I want to talk about different ways to read in and around and about Bram Stoker's Dracula. So one of the ways that I want to show you is a couple of great editions. Again, I want to stress, you don't need annotations of any kind to read Dracula. You will love it without any annotations. But if you want annotations, there are a couple of great editions. that will give you the whole world and everything in it, everything to do with this book. One is by the great editor Leslie Klinger. This is the new annotated Dracula. Uh, big, fat, hardcover, tons and tons of illustrations. You get the whole of the text, but you get tons and tons of notes. Huge introduction. Tons of appendices in the back. And a little bit older, but the same thing, my favorite uh, version of this is The Essential Dracula by Leonard Wolfe, which also has the whole of the text and illustrations and tons of notes, the difference being that uh, Wolfe is funny. Leslie Klinger is very much not, <laughs> but Wolfe is funny. His annotations all throughout the essential Dracula are, uh, they're very informative. They're very opinionated, which is always a lot of fun with an annotator, but they are also quite often funny. Uh, so I would use those two as big annotated editions of Dracula. If that's what you want, I think they're the two best ones. Uh, but there's another, in addition to reading the novel by itself, just find a copy of the novel and read it. Your bookstore will have a copy. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a treatment of Bram Stoker's Dracula that I want to recommend because it is really, really good. It's, it's not usual, but it is really, really good. And that is Roy Thomas, the Marvel Comics writer, writing a comic called Tomb of Dracula. You see here, this is, you see a hundred dollar price tag up in the corner there because this is the cover to uh, a Tomb of Dracula omnibus. I believe there have been two big fat hardcovers. God knows how expensive they are. But if you can get your hands on the Essential Tomb of Dracula, which was a black and white reprint volume, might be less expensive, uh, or any of these issues, uh, or I think there might be an Epic collection, which would be, you know, less expensive than these big hardcovers. If you can get your hands on any of these, they are an amazing realization of Bram Stoker's character. And they're not, it's hard to explain the appeal, but this is a version of Dracula that is very literate. It's very intentional. It's very idiosyncratic. It doesn't, it doesn't bear much in the way of being an homage to anybody else's Dracula. It really is an individual creation, uh, in a way that I wanted to make sure I recommend. Uh, and then one other thing that I want to recommend for the number one spot, keeping in mind that the number one spot really is just to read Dracula. That's all. You can get a free copy at Project Gutenberg and have it on your Kindle in a minute. So I don't need to worry about how to find it. It's, it has been reprinted more often than almost any other book. Uh, but if you're really interested, in addition to the annotated books, there's also a biography of Bram Stoker that is not like any other Bram Stoker biography. This is David Scull's book, Something in the Blood. I wanted to recommend that as well uh, for a vampire, even though it's not fiction. For a vampire fiction uh starter kit, I wanted to recommend this. If you are interested in this figure, and maybe some of the Freudian threads running through his books, the subconscious threads, uh, then this is the book to read. Uh, Bram Stoker's had a million biographies, but this is this one, I've read a lot of those biographies, and this one did so, does things that no other has ever attempted. And I'm not saying that this will uh, help you to understand any other things that Bram Stoker wrote, but I believe it will really change the way you think of Dracula. <laughs> that is the key, after all, because despite the best efforts of 
small publishers over the last hundred years, Stoker is never going to be famous for anything other than Dracula. So you might as well just concentrate on that. But I want I want to uh, I want to keep in mind that the, the key thing is the book itself. Uh, and that, of course, tops a uh, vampire fiction starter. <laughs> is, uh, Dracula has to top that. If you don't read anything else on this list, you have to read that. Uh, and again, we are doing a read to you. We're re doing a read aloud, so feel free <laughs> to, to listen in for that. But uh, I can also strongly recommend the experience of curling up with the book and letting it work on your imagination. Uh, but anyway, I just thought that... that uh, a vampire fiction starter kit would be good for October. I'm thinking also of doing a horror fiction starter kit, and a couple of these would appear. Dracula, of course, would appear on such a list, but maybe a couple of these as well. I will uh, I will mull over that. Horror is a bit of a weak spot for me. I've read a lot of it, but I'm not sure that I'm in any position to make a starter kit. Maybe one of you should do it instead. Uh, but anyway, that's going to wrap up this starter kit. I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube. <laughs>